individuals tend not to go to sleep when they're being talked about or if they hear someone they know and care about being talked about. Uh, chances are that um, not too many people will fall asleep in the next half hour uh, based on that. I was informed by one of my students uh, that this lecture might be qualified for uh, the ACS 1000 Ancients and my thought was, I began teaching here in 1979, so um, I'm ancient. <laughs> I qualify all by myself, just by being here. And it's great to be here with you this evening. The name of the presentation, I am spiritual but not religious. Pray tell what's up with that. I am spiritual but not religious. That's not my position. Um, and I'll explain why. Um, but it, it's an important, significant phenomenon for our society. Those who have me in my two sections are familiar with circles. Circles represent for us uh, worldviews. Uh, constructed sets of what individuals or communities regard as real or not real, true or not true, good or not good, possible but not possible. My position, my location is on the outside of the spiritual but not religious. And this blue circle here on the border we could take as the cohorts who aren't sure whether they are or not. So if you're not sure, let me raise a few possibilities that might determine for yourself whether you are or not spiritual, but not religious. If through time, for multiple, unreflected, unintentional reasons, you just sort of drifted away from your family faith, you might be a nun or spiritual but not religious. If the word religion makes you think of rules, commandments, Dogmatism, rigidity, hierarchy, patriarchy, exclusivity, boredom, judgmentalism, hypocrisy, undue political involvement, outmodedness, self-preservation, and money, you may be a nun. None of the above as far as religion identification goes. If you can't be quickly Googled, for example, I'm an Eastern Byzantine Catholic, you could just Google that and come right up, learn all about me and my faith identification. Or somebody introduces himself or herself as a Muslim, you know, um, Baha'i. But if who you are and how you are isn't easily Googleable, that's a that word, you may be unknown.
If you have become aware that the leaders of your faith community, mostly men, have set themselves on the wrong side of history regarding the hot button issues of inclusivity, equality, and self-determination, you may be unknown. If your spirit feels elevated or inspired and casually kicking back and listening to your favorite tunes more than spending appointed pew time sitting straight up, wearing uncomfortable shoes in a church, you may be unknown. If you harmonize, feel more in tune with your natural surroundings, or the environment in general, than with anything the combined parish choir and music ensemble performs, no matter how masterfully you may be. If they changed on our currency and God we trust to, in the scientific method we trust, you may be spiritual. No. Religious. If the phrase simply being a good person is enough, is well enough, sufficient for any happenstance. If you feel somewhat alienated, isolated, marginalized, and would steal a pretty much religious society. But you can identify with this person. When asked about my religious beliefs, I clam up. Last year, some friends of mine who have a band did a prayer circle before hitting the stage for a show. They're not a Christian band, but they're a group of guys whose faith is important to them, and I respect that. They invited me in because I'm the band's unofficial sixth member who sells their t-shirts and beer koozies in the back of the room. I froze. I had no idea what to do. Did I belong there? Do I close my eyes? Take it? Look down? Do I do? I grabbed my friend Bobby and, he made, and I made him join me. I don't know if he's forgiven me yet. Probably not. Absolution is such a gray area. And finally, if you can project yourself writing this on an online dating forum, truly I'm in no way a cold-blooded atheist, nor am I a moralizing prude. I'm relaxed, I'm friendly, approachable, I'm spiritual, not religious. You may be spiritual, but not religious. The study of the subject of S, not religious, was really spurred and confirmed by this study done by the Pew Research Center. A quarter of Americans see themselves as spiritual but not religious. down and they got the religious and spiritual since 2012 precipitously down spiritual but not religious with a bullet upwards the neither religious nor spiritual the atheists have remained pretty constant. And the religious 
but not spiritual. Those who go through the motions of religion, maybe for a number of reasons, maybe to, to keep peace in the family, maybe uh, they own a flower shop or a funeral home or a car dealership near the parish church and it's a source of possible clientele, whatever. But the one with the momentum, the group with the momentum, is the spiritual but not religious. The term itself came, according to uh, Dr. Matt Hedstrom uh, at Virginia, the University of Virginia, um, from the early 2000s when online dating became a thing. Some push it back further than that, the concept back to the 1960s in the, the um, let's say those uh, services to overcome uh, addictions where it is counseled to be in touch with a, uh, an undefined non-church related higher power. Studies began to be developed, just a few titles, The Sovereign Soul, A Spiritual But Not Religious Woman's Guide to Living a Soul-Centered Life, <laughs> Spiritual But Not Religious, The Search for Meaning in the Material World, 2019, Being Spiritual But Not Religious, Past, Present, and Futures. The one I would recommend for a starting study uh, would be this title, Linda Mer Mer uh, Dante's uh, Belief Without Borders, Inside the Minds of the Spiritual but Not Religious, Oxford University Press, 2018. The demographic uh, I don't want to, you know, attempt to, you know, overwhelm you with statistics, but uh, so just summar summarily, among the group, the SBNRs or the nuns, uh, equal distribution between males and females. And contradistinction to the, the non-spiritual, non-religious, the, the atheists, where the males uh, predominantly outnumber females. It's decidedly a youth movement, age 26 and under, beginning to predominate. Politically liberal, two and a half times more lean Democrat than Republican, with both parties in the process of losing out to a growing number of non-party affiliated, independent, non-church affiliated, nuns. None of the above. SBMRs. And then the footnote, uh, Generation Z, or iGen, are also nuns, uh, non subscribing in general, non car carrying, non dues paying, non joiners of traditional civic workforce organizations as well. Think of uh, the Rotary Club or, or labor unions. It's, they too, like religions and political parties, are losing out. How and why now? Generation Z, I Gen, the current generation, is a culture of choice, self-actualization, freedom of expression, and fluidity. It's a sociological fact that religious commitment is more intense when communities are homogeneous, 
And you, my dear students, are the most ethnically, racially, and religiously diverse generation in our country. And of course, the information age factor. Easy, quick internet access to alternative ways of thinking. What do nouns sound like? Yeah. Maybe I'd, uh, I'd like to play for you a, a presentation. It was for National Public Radio a few years ago, where young adults agreed to sit down for two hours within a, it was in a synagogue setting um, and just be interviewed. And it was part of a, a week-long series called Losing Our Religion. So let's give a listen. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Amnesty, on a journey to transform healthcare payments, helping healthcare providers streamline the revenue cycle and offer a better financial experience for patients. A whole new future is opening up. Visit Waystar.com to learn more. We're picking up this morning with a conversation we began earlier this week. Our colleague David Green sat down in the sanctuary of a synagogue with a group of young Americans for our series, Losing Our Religion. And David, remind us who they are. Well, Renee, uh, we, we got interested in all of this when we saw a study from the Pew Research Center. It said that a third of young adults in this country say that they don't identify with any organized religion. And so for this conversation, we met with some young men and women in their 20s and 30s, and they have all been struggling with the role of faith and religion in their lives. Now, this is Melissa Edelman. She was raised Catholic, but doesn't call herself that anymore. Moving away from Catholicism for me was a loss and a negative thing and sort of, you know, a rejection of a set of beliefs. But at the same time, it's not like you move away from religion and then have nothing or have sort of this emptiness where you feel like, oh, geez, I wish that I believed in something because now, I, there, you know, I have this negative space in my life. I think you can fill it with lots of really good things. So she doesn't feel an emptiness without religion. Is that a sense that you got from everyone at the table? I would say it really is. I mean, none of these young people felt a feeling of emptiness, but they do feel conflicted, and they seem to recognize that religion fills certain needs. And, and let's listen to more here. We're going to hear again from Melissa Edelman, but first, Kyle Simpson. He found Christianity when he was a teenager. He's drifted away from religion, but he's had these moments of doubt. Last year, when I turned 26, I had my mini existential crisis when I realized, um, oh my gosh, what's going to happen when I die? Am I just going to end up in the ground and like everything I've worked for, all my memories are for naught? I, I still have that feeling every once in a while in the stereotypical moments when you're like sitting alone in the dark and you can't go to bed and you start thinking about that. But I don't know if that's emptiness. That's more just a fear that... I hope others have. Um, are you jealous in a way of, of people who are part of an organized religious community and, and have that answer and, and kind of feel like they know what will happen when they die and, and don't have to ask that question? I'm, I'm definitely jealous of that comfort. I don't know if it's like jealous is the word because I don't know if I want what that is because I wouldn't be able to believe it right now. For me, it's not about the beliefs that I wish I had, because I, I don't envy other people their beliefs, I guess. I'm comfortable with the place that I've come to. I do seek that sense of community, I think is probably the biggest thing for me, that, that tradition and community and support networks, that's what I would look for. But you don't have to have a sense of community from religion. I don't get my sense of community from religion. My community, I'm a veteran, I'm a, I ride sport bikes. I'm a fan of a football team. You know, people can get that sense of community from everywhere. 
That third voice there is a young Iraq War veteran named Rigoberto Perez. He was raised in a strict Christian home. And now sitting just to his right in our circle, a young woman named Liz Reeves. She has felt unwelcome when she's gone to church because of her spiritual doubts and also her views on social issues. But Liz is also looking for that sense of belonging that religion can provide. I still feel like I would benefit from that community, and I still, I think, struggle feeling like I cannot be a member of it. And so I think if I found a religious community that made me feel accepted for who I am, that I would be much, I'd be very open to pursuing that. And I actually have some friends who are members of a particular church who've been really trying to get me to go with them to this church because they keep telling me, oh, don't worry, it's okay, everybody, you know, that's what this church is all about. And so I'm certainly open to the idea, and I would like my children way down the road to also have exposure to religion and ask these questions of themselves. And I think that's really important. Do you do you pray? So growing up, I used to do something really silly. It's going to sound very silly when it comes out, but every day at eleven eleven, the time, I would make a, some sort of wish. Which, looking back on it, it was it was prayers. What it was, um, I didn't Doesn't really sound silly. <laughs> well, you know, the, I mean, my my soccer number was always eleven. I have this weird thing. I've kind of some weird superstitions and things like that. Um, I never would have admitted that I was praying at the time, I don't think, because I didn't feel comfortable with the idea that it was something religious at that time. But looking back on it, that's certainly what it was. And I occasionally will catch myself at 11-11 kind of doing that again. Still today. You, you... Yeah, from time to time, yep. And it is some sort of prayer, but I think it's more of questioning myself or challenging myself to do something or to think about something than it is kind of prayer in the most traditional of ways. I do something fairly similar, actually. You know, I grew up with prayer, speaking to yourself and not get expecting a response. Um, so, you know, and I, some people may call it prayer, but I do carry internal dialogues very similar. Uh, please let me work through this. Give me more strength to deal with this or trying to work through how I can affect a change in that particular circumstance. So, I, I mean, like you said, some people may consider it prayer. And, I don't consider it that because I'm, you know, it's, it's me. I'm finding it something within myself, but others may. Melissa, do you pray? Um, not on a regular basis, but I do. I mean, I found it important to me to um, be thankful and to be more cognizant of the good things that happen in life. And so when really awesome things happen, I try to remember to take the time to feel the gratitude that I have for that. Um, and so for me, I think that's that's my sense of prayer. And, and you kind of consider that replacing traditional prayer, your own kind of version of prayer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then the traditional prayer that I did as a child growing up was, you know, every night to get down on my knees and ask God to take care of the people that I cared about, um, you know, and to make bad things go away and make good things happen. And I think this version of it for me is um, just much more in accord with with my set of sort of moral values. And so. Go. Yeah, I I do, and I don't know what to make of it because I feel like a hypocrite. And um, but I only do when I'm at my most scared or my most fearful. And you pray when you're at your most most fearful. Yeah, and my most vulnerable. And like I said, I don't know what to do with that <laughs> because it really does not align with anything that I've said all day today. Yet I still find myself doing that. And, Renee, as you can hear, these, these young Americans are, are conflicted. I, I mean, we, we spoke for two hours, and they talked about having this respect for religion, but feeling like it's not something they can totally identify with right now. And if our listeners want to get to know them better, the people in our roundtable, uh, there are photos of them and, and some more details about their lives at our website, npr.org. And we're going to be wrapping up our series tomorrow, the series Losing Our Religion. What will we hear? Well, we're going to turn to two religious leaders, including a Catholic priest. He says he wants to be adaptable to keep the door open to people who feel alienated from the Catholic Church, but he says there are limits. I know there's some things I can't do. <laughs> there's some things that, that are, are simply, at this point, not, not changeable. I personally am not able to ordain women, for example. So that's Father Mike Sarufka, a Catholic priest in Chicago. We'll hear from him and also from a Methodist minister in Texas tomorrow. Morning Edition's David Green. Thanks very much. Thanks, Renee. Very articulate uh, young adults. I think you would agree.
Some pertinent questions uh, to be addressed. Um, are the nuns a uh, cultural revolution? The suggestion here tonight is no. Uh, revolutions usually involved, energized, concerted, focused, rising up for a specific cause. To be unaffiliated with any religion is often not a conscious choice at all. Um, it's not a movement or an organized revolution against religion, uh, is the point. Number two, a seismic social change. It could be argued, yes. Young adults are more religiously unaffiliated than any earlier generation at the same age. And in past generations, there has been a common religiosity drop-off among young adults. I mean, it was considered, you know, natural. But many return to their faith tradition once they settle down into a permanent job or started taking on family responsibilities. They started to return to their faith identification. That's not happening with the nuns. Think Tank fellow Daniel A. Cox states that current best evidence points to young SBNRs staying that way, having children and raising children with the same SBNR worldviews. Number three, should religions be concerned? I would recommend it. Uh, the consequences for mainline religions seem to be quite significant. 49%, almost 50% of SBNRs attest they seldom, if ever, attend services. And this is in comparison to 33 percent of the general public, just practically speaking. You know, that's uh, when you pass the basket and not as many are there, uh, it puts a burden on the practical running of the institutions. Question, um, might they the SBNRs uh, evolved into a religion of their own. Again, indications suggest no. Um, given the distrust of institutions, the lack of any central organization or commonly recognized set of authorities, no s common sacred text to rally around? Um, probably not. And going forward, should society in general be concerned? That is a very polarizing question. Some years ago, social philosopher and sociologist of religion, Will Herberg, cautioned that we may be unwittingly creating what he called a cut flower culture. Many commonly affirmed values are fruits of faith traditions of previous generations. 
which is a very rich soil. A soil that is absent in those who disassociate with those faith traditions. Last week in the New York Times op-ed writer Brett Stevens opined that there, that here in the 21st century we have created, quote, algorithms and digital platforms that have strangled our brains. The new technologies have shortened our attention spans, heightened our anxieties, made us more prone to depression, and more in need of outside validation and left us less capable of patient reflection. Red flags abound for those who look to tie the growth in social distress with the growth of the nuns. It is a human, I think, fact that we see as we are whether progressive or conservative, and we find what we look for. Some would see growth of nuns and note that the parallel is to be seen in the growth of uh, major depressions, especially among teens, suicide, and just plain loneliness and alienation. These commentators would see SBNR as a byproduct of a dysfunctioning culture. Flip side. Vigorously challenging such conclusions are those who would say, no, the nuns are not byproducts. As a population, they are a passionate wellspring, positive wellspring of selfless service. They are proven to be. They are reflexive peace and justice advocates. They are most adaptive to these postmodern contexts of ours. Nuns are our best chance for a healthy new cultural consensus promoting human solidarity, earth care, human dignity. freedom, and equality. And then those are, there are those who would say that the nuns are neither saviors nor menaces. NBNRs or SBNRs are already being benignly co-opted for branding commodities in niche market economies of ours. You can subscribe to these publications. Spirituality and health being one of them. And read all about refreshing bath rituals. <laughs> And this is actually a drop down of all sorts of products, uh, bath salts, skin strokers, special candles to put around the tub for your purchase, for your spiritual well-being. <laughs> Undeniable, though, is that NB, SBNR is an element in our social polarization. 
Uh, last week in the USA Today, they did a, st uh, you know, a feature entitled Younger Jews Increasingly Non- or Ultra-Orthodox. There's that polarization. I'm, I'm not doing a Catholic study, uh, but I'm getting the impression from anecdotal reports around the country that as more and more young Catholics are becoming nuns, emptying the pews, the seats in the seminaries are being filled more and more by traditionalist young know, students. Again, that polarization dimension. What is my position regarding SBNR phenomena as a religious and spiritual RAS? Religious and spiritual RAS. And I am religious. I have a religious calling card that I present when, upon occasion when I need it. Here's a, a, from my tradition, my Eastern Catholic tradition, a wedding service. We, the bride and groom wear crowns as a sign that they are king and queen of their household kingdom of faith. Pre-COVID, there was a shared wedding cup. And it's in a church, not on a beach, not in a nice park. I qualify, I don't qualify as an SBNR. Um, I have a very non-SBNR response to uh, a question I often get in my classes. For all my classes, uh, the first day I hand out blank postcards and ask for anonymous, I call them no limits questions. Just anything that we want to ask that we could talk about as a class this semester. And often I get, among all the thousands of religions, is there one best religion? And my answer is, yes. And the answer to the very best religion in the world is, mine. But it's a very qualified response, very qualified. I'm saying mine in the same sense that I say I can't imagine a better mother than my own mom. I'm not making, I'm not making a judgment on your mom, or your mom, or your mother, or your mother. I just said I can't imagine a better mother. And I hope you and, and each of my friends can say the same thing about their mothers, about their religion, about their worldviews. And I would like to learn more about that. And I would hope that those others get to know theirs better than they do in studying mine. As a RAS, religious and spiritual, I'm perplexed by young parents who quite proudly assert, I will not force my religious worldview on my children as my parents forced upon me. I will respect their freedom of choice. This makes as much sense to me, in laying out my position here, as saying, I will not disrespect my child's freedom by forcing the English language on them. Foundational language, vernaculars, idioms, condition the very possibility of thought and choosing 
even if the future tween teenager surveys a couple dozen languages and then chooses to only speak Lithuanian for the rest of his or her life. My parents gifted me with their particular religious vernacular, which I came to variously own, shun, then reclaim, just as I do to various degrees. Variously have owned, shunned, reconciled, and reclaimed my parents themselves as my parents. My thoughts as a theologian, as an academician, as a religious theologian, I believe that spirituality and the religious are very, very integral. To the book Antale by Mercadante makes the point that there she calls out the artificial dichotomizing of spirituality on one side and religion on the other. I think it's dismaying when they are portrayed as separated and compartmentalized in ways that lend to mutual trivializing and stereotyping of one another. Nuns are not slackers. And religions are not stones passed hand to hand through the ages. Rather, as per Harvard's divinities, Diana Tapp, religions are not stones, but more like dynamic rivers, flowing, raging, creative, splitting, converging, all while constantly needing refreshment from their sources. drawing near to a close. I feel amidst the confluence of spirituality and religion, I applaud the nun's rejection of all that comes from bad theology of bad religion. Bad theology is ideology asserting self-justification of bad religion marked by fundamentalism, fanaticism, insistence on blind faith. Classic theology is defined as faith seeking understanding. As a theologian, I believe the best theology addresses the whole person, the whole being, thought, attitudes, integrated in external behavior. Theology is what something to be done, something to be lived. And theologically, we are all open to existential journeys towards transcendent horizons spurred by our constant questioning and need for reasons to go on existing. Theology is to be done, is to be lived, and the nuns get out of bed each morning to endure difficulties and find joy and fulfillment. And in doing this, SBNR, I believe, is a type of lived theology. of the future. I believe that people of spirituality and religious folk can, I think, reach out to one another. 
and understand one another. In our classes, um, my students would tell, convey to you that we're in a project of forging understandings across worldviews, across the boundaries, where, for example, the church word faith could be understood as trust, sin as the betrayal of trust, grace as giftedness. How will theology itself be understood? In a way, I think that both the spiritual and the religious together could perhaps embody and live. And that is a way of thinking of theology, not only as faith seeking understanding, but as trust seeking trustworthiness. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions. If anybody wants to ask a joke question, I'd be interested in comments actually okay. on um, the podcast. Uh, could you relate to any? For any observations or questions, we'd be fine too. Please. Um, so, I am a uh, Roman Catholic, and in my uh, church, my priest has like had us be um, like singing um, like non traditional music, like. Uh, uh, Christian pop music for like, um, like extra masses, and he just kind of like pushes it to the side and he asks him, Can we sing like on a music and regular mass? And it's kind of like a traditionalist thing, mm -hmm. and it also kind of off puts me because I like to worship and like singing. Mm -hmm. So, in that way, I kind of related to the um, like feeling like disconnected from religion and feeling like it's not for me. You feel, you feel like it's getting like squishy Catholicism? Yeah, it feels like it's like old and stale and it's like not, I can't relate to it almost because it's not like what, what I grew up in when I'm like comfortable with like modern music. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would imagine that uh, you could find soulmates that you can commiserate with and, mm -hmm. and, and strategize with. Mm -hmm. well, that's a grace, that's a gift in your life. You treasure those people. Absolutely. Thank you. Please. I made a statement that on the spiritual but not the theology, what's your opinion on the idea that we are all truly religious and worship something, whether that might not be the traditional religion itself? Does that make sense? Oh, yes, yes. Um, I, I, I fully subscribe to, for example, um, Paul Tillich characterized faith as ultimate concern. Everyone has an ultimate concern. A definition of salvation, if you will. I don't, I don't think it's for me to judge anybody else's how they construe, construe their ultimate concern. I can only challenge you and challenge myself. Whatever your ultimate concern is, is it big enough? Is it powerful enough to get you out of bed every day for the rest of your life? And if it isn't, you better, I don't recommend, counsel, find a more powerful uh, faith. <laughs> a more powerful uh, motivation. So generally I would say yes, I could identify with your question and uh, bring me back to something that I can connect to myself. Thank you very much. Up to you, Rachel. 
sacred scriptures, every religion does, but I, my point was that it doesn't look like that the SBNRs will be able to gel around a commonly agreed sacred writing or single leader or leaders. I don't know if that helps. Okay. Thank you. Would, Joe, would either you or Matt really like to announce the new group? That's oh, the yes. Group? Thank you very much. Matthew. Oh, my name is Greg Block. I'm a okay. graduate student. Uh, I'm studying ministry and theology. And uh, I'm actually starting like a series of events, basically conversations, um, for people who either identify as spiritual not religious or just aren't like really sure where they fall on the spectrum of like spirituality and religiosity. And so um, I've kind of been personally in that that boat for the last couple of years now. And so my only agenda with starting this, this group is basically just to establish a community where people can talk about these um, these like questions and just like themes of life that are important. Um, but if you don't have like you know the space or uh, people to do that with, it's like where can you find that? So um, the first one's going to be the week after fall break, so October twenty first. I have some flyers here. Um, I'll probably stand outside in the back if you're interested. You can grab a flyer, but. Um, and also ask me any questions. And I would actually also just add to your question that was just asked that, um, like, you might want to look into like a Unitarian Universalist church. Um, that's usually a space where people can come with uh, any kind of faith or belief, set of beliefs, and they pretty much accept uh, everyone's position and try to kind of have some intentional practices in, in spiritual, you know, categories. So, but uh, yeah, my name is Greg again, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of you. Thank you. Okay. Seven. Time for one more question. Oh, please. Thank you. Um, what would your advice be for someone who like, may have had a religious background, but then were kind of like isolated from whatever like church or community and from um, your Oh, um, make use of of the tap that's here. Uh, be in touch through chat groups, be in touch through um, maybe uh, Zoom with, with the people, uh, maybe start a, say it's a Bible study of yourself, uh, by yourself or others. Um, I, you know, take advantage of, of what is available as far as making connections with like-minded like spiritual <laughs> seekers as yourself. Uh, and I wish you luck in that if that is your case. I wish you all the best. Thank you. One more. Thank you. Uh, I really like the example that you gave about your mother being the best and your relation being the best. Yeah, I can't think of a better one. Yeah, uh, especially because you're not criticizing other relations. No. I, I was a bit confused about the example comparing relation to language because. Uh, there is more plurality in, in religion. You do not necessarily need a religion to live in a society, but for example, if you live in a country that speaks English, you really need to learn English to communicate. It's just the basics. So, 
the social context is completely different. And although both are gifts from your parents, from your background, from your heritage or whatever, uh, should they be compared? Um, to this extent, John, uh, thank you for your, your, your uh, question, Dash challenge. I was thinking to this extent, choices are not only choices for, but choices from. So, but if you don't have a choice from something, uh, I think that inhibits the quality of your choice for something. Um, so that was uh, actually, I probably overplayed my hand with that example, if you're right, to, to call me on it. But that's what I had in mind. That it, it helps the choice process if you're not only choosing for something, but choosing from something, too. That, that's all I was trying to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Father Joe. Thank, Thank you. you.